speaker for this annual Mandela lecture that we have, Evelyn Lindner, who's already been here and she's very happy that she's actually been engaging with you in much smaller scenes where she really can interact with you. Uh, but Evelyn, describe, you describe yourself as a global citizen, that you're at home everywhere. I think what you've done in the other classes and, and groups you've been in, you, you've very much told about yourself in the session and I assume that that personal touch will be in what you do from now. So I think without further ado, I just give the floor to you, Evelyn, and just to say She's going to stay here until supper and a bit after, so I hope that for those of you who really would like to continue the talk with Evelyn afterwards, that you use the opportunity, but Wonderful. welcome. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it's me who has to thank you. I'm so, so, so happy to be here. It's such a, a gift to be with you. So I want to thank you to ha that you invited me. It was wonderful. And I want to thank you all that you are here. It's such a gift that you are all here. This is my father when he was young in Silesia on his horse. Happy young man was to inherit the farm of his parents. This is the Second World War. This is the end of the Second World War. Everything was destroyed in Europe, not only in Europe, Japan. There was a window of opportunity after the Second World War for the Human Rights Declaration to be adopted in 1948. A window of opportunity. What is the core sentence of human rights ideals? It's the sentence, every human being is born free and equal in dignity and rights. This is the core ideal. This is me. I'm born 1954, six years after the declaration was adopted. And you see me there with my father. You see that he has only one arm now. He was forced to be a soldier in the Second World War. He under, you know, sabotaged the war, he was punished. As a result, he lost one arm. He lost his beloved old, older brothers who died in the war. He lost his father who died of sorrow of having lost his farm. My father is displaced away from Silesia, from his farm. He has lost his homeland. He is a broken man. Uh, he is a displaced person in what later became West Germany. He had a little room there with my mother and me in a farm of other people. Profoundly unwelcome displaced person. So when you ask me where are you from, I'm from displacement. I'm born into a, an identity of here where we are. We are not at home. There is no home for us to go to. This is where I'm from. And from this background, I have developed a life, or my life has become a project. My life has never been a normal life, given that background. It has become a project. What kind of project? A project to, in, the, in the spirit of human rights ideals. A project asking, is it possible that we, as human beings, can work for a never again, never again war and genocide, never again uh, ecocide, you know ecocide, the word ecocide, the destruction of the, of the uh, environmental and uh, the environment and sociocide, the destruction of our social cohesion. Can we do something? Can we prevent that? And if so, what must we do? What are the greatest obstacles? So the title or the, the heading over my life project is what must we do? What are the greatest obstacles? If we say we are one human family on one planet and we have extreme global challenges to address, we need to cooperate. What are the greatest hurdles and obstacles to this cooperation? And my intuitive answer is 
that humiliation, dynamics, circle of humiliation are the greatest obstacle. And in order to get that, to, to study all that, I started to live globally, as I call it, when I was 20 years old. So now I'm 64, so I have been living globally for more than 40 years, at home on all continents, always the same life project. Is it possible that we as humankind, as human species, can have a dignified future? And if yes, how? I have written a number of books, and as I said to Arne, you, uh, I, I give access to you, you get free uh, PDF files. This is a Norwegian one, this is the last one from 2017. And just now I'm uh, working on uh, a book that comes out this, this year called it, the same title as the talk today. So just ask Arne, he can give you the PDF files of everything I have written. Here you see my father in 2006. I think I have healed his trauma to a large extent through my global work. He's now 93. This is him now. And he is in very, very good shape. And I think partly it's because of my global work of trying to heal the world, I have healed him, or at least part. This global work has brought me into a bird's eye perspective with respect to us, the human species. Who are we, homo sapiens, homo sapiens? Who are we who sit here? We are here on this planet only since about 200,000 years, perhaps longer. And we started to populate this planet from Africa. And we had a party. For the first 95% of our time on this planet, we had a party. We could always follow the food. We could go to the next valley and find more food. We had a party, a win-win situation. And if the planet were larger, we would still today follow the food. But the moment was bound to come where we had filled up the planet to a certain extent. The anthropological terminology is circumscription. And what I say now is extremely simplified. So at some point, the planet was, was full, or at least the easily, easily accessible parts. It was not that easy to go to the next valley and uh, follow the wild food. There were other people. This was started to happen about 12,000 years ago. So the past 5% of our history are profoundly different to the first 95% of our history. We have to know that. When we think of our history, what is our history? There is a, a marked and extremely important break about 10,000, 12,000 years ago. It started to be. So I have another way of showing this. If we look at the first 95% of our history, and I say, I respect myself so much, and I respect you the same, then we are on one line. And if we look at archaeology and the research there, it seems that the nine, first 95% of our history, we lived in small egalitarian groups that were quite egalitarian. So we were able to man manifest this equality in dignity, in worthiness. We manifested it. And I use the lying eight that you see there, I use that as a symbol for dialogue. So we were able to be in dialogue in equality and dignity. You know, and of course I'm, I'm now simplifying for the first 95% of our history. What happened then? About 12,000 years ago something happened. We adapted to a win-lose situation. We adapted by erecting what Rihanna Eisler a social scientist calls dominator societies. Hierarchical societies with a strong man at the top, the young man being sent to the borders to find, you know, to learn that it is honorable to be a hero, to kill and die in defense of the in-group, and the women inside to raise the next generation. This is the dominator model of society. And in the past 10,000 years, we had this model almost everywhere on the planet. And 
in this context, humiliation is pro-social. It is a duty. The father of the family has the duty to beat his disobedient wife until 1868 here in Norway. The m man had the right to beat his wife, his disobedient wife, everywhere in the world. And we still have it today, of course, as you know, in some regions. So the kings, the masters, the elites had it as a duty to humiliate their underlings and to, treat, to teach them respect, to teach them humility, for respect for the hierarchy, and the hierarchy was regarded as divinely ordained and a natural order. So if people at the bottom were suffering from being humiliated, they did not necessarily protest because it was like God's will, like a medicine that tastes bitter, that has, is still a medicine. So this was the world we lived in for the past 10,000 years, roughly. And we are all still socialized into that. We still come into that, except Norway. Norway is a unique exception, which is very interesting. interesting. So the human rights ideal of equality and dignity, what is it? It's basically the dismantling of this hierarchy, of this power gradient, the dismantling of it. It is going back to the one line in the middle that we had in the first 95% of our history. It's going back to before the Neolithic Revolution. It's as if we, as humankind, in 1948, turned against the past 10,000 years and said, no, we think now that it is illegitimate to have slaves. It's illegitimate that masters turn other human beings into tools in their hands. This we don't want anymore. We deem it illegitimate. So this is a U-turn, a moral, ethical U-turn that we as humankind decided upon in 1948. We made illegitimate what we did for the past 10,000 years. So when Mandela went to the uh, white uh, elite in South uh, Africa, he said, no longer can you arrogate superiority. Times have changed. Please come down, step down, humble yourself. Join us in the middle, into a new future where we all are together. And Mandela went to the black brothers and sisters and said to them, look, to be down is not nature's order, it's not divinely ordained, no. It's a violation of your human rights. It's a violation of your dignity. You have a right to rise up. Please rise up and we meet in the middle. This was the message of Mandela, and this is my message also. This is the, my work. And I wrote my doctoral dissertation on uh, gen humiliation and genocide and war with case studies Rwanda, Somalia, on the background of Nazi Germany. And if you look at the case of Rwanda, you learn something. What happened in Rwanda? If Mandela had done the following, he would have followed the, the example of Rwanda. Mandela could have done the following. Mandela could have come out of prison. He could have said to all his black brothers and sisters, take out your hammers, take out your machetes, take out, out your knives, go to your white neighbors and kill them all. This is what happened in Rwanda. Mandela did not do that. He stopped in the middle. In my third book, Desmond Tutu wrote the foreword, and Desmond Tutu wrote, the white people in South Africa do not know how lucky they are. So therefore, I do not use the word empowerment. I use the word entrustment. Because empowerment, you know, the Hutu, the, the, the servants in Rwanda were empowered, empowered, empowered so far that they rose up and became the new tyrant and tried to kill their former master. What Mandela did, he stopped in the middle and he invited everybody into the middle. So this is important for human rights defenders and advocates. We have to be very aware that we, when we speak about empowerment that we stop in the middle. So what is dignity?
to me, dignity is, and I think now I need you. And I don't know how to combine it with the... <laughs> If you hold that to me, look at this. You see that this is a lying eight. It's the infinity symbol, the Möbius strip, the symbol for dialogue, for partnership, for non-dualism in philosophy. You see that? It's, it's a lying eight. You see it there on the picture. And dignity to me is when I respect myself so much and I respect you the same, then we are on one line. We stand upright and we are connected in unity, in diversity. And we are, you know, it is not, diversity is not division. We are not like that. And un unity is not uniformity. It's not like that. So it's, it's not unity, uniformity without diversity, and it's not division without unity. It is, we are two and one at the same time, unity in diversity, non-dualism, we are one and two in, at the same time. And um, we are at one, at one level. And here, if, uh, you know, you have um, another definition of dignity that I do not resonate with, and it has to do with the terminology of a dignitary. A dignitary is a person who is higher up. And uh, yeah, wonderful, yeah. Uh, so uh, now I'm a dignitary, I'm arrogant, I'm higher up, I look down on her, I feel that I can humiliate her, she is a lesser being. This is humiliation, you see that? This is humiliation. Now I humiliate her. And you know, I'm, this is the, the old definition in the old system of the dominator society. This is their dignity is a hierarchical notion. So you are humiliated now, and I'm arrogant. You see that? I'm arrogant. This is the old definition of dignity, which comes to, becomes visible when you use the, the terminology of a dignitary. Thank you. And now comes another uh, uh, definition of dignity that I do not resonate with. Especially in the United States, uh, everybody says, oh, dignity is a useless concept. What is good is, the only thing is good is, is autonomy. So this is the definition of dignity as ruthless individualism. We are equal, yes, we have equality in dignity, but we have no solidarity. We have no solidarity, we are competing against each other in a rat race. This, we are disconnected. So this is a, a definition of dignity that I do not uh, resonate. I thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> so here we have uh, unity in diversity. And you see that? Isn't that a lovely... Isn't that beautiful? You like it? <laughs> so, if we look at a timeline, at our history as human beings, then we see that this idea of equality in dignity, it was always there. It's not a Western new idea, it has always been there. All our religious fathers, you know, the founders of philosophy, often started with the idea of equality in dignity for everybody. And then, as soon as something was institutionalized, for example, yeah, a religion or a philosophy, then it became hierarchical and betrayed its message, original message of equality in dignity. And then we have something very interesting. It's the year 1757. This is a very interesting year in, in, in the English language. It is a marker for this U-turn. You remember, there is this U-turn that we decided upon in 1948, and it has a pre-runner in, in the English language. What happened in 1757? For the first time in the English language, to humiliate meant to violate the dignity of uh, an individual. Before, the, to humiliate was pro-social. It was the duty of the master to humiliate underlings.
The only people who could ang get angry at humiliation were equals, like aristocrats could go to duel to restore their humiliated honor, but the beaten wife could not go to duel against her beating husband. So, 1757 is a similar U-turn to humiliate from being pro-social became anti-social. And then we have 1948, and, and then we have something very interesting. In 1948, we adopted the Human Rights Declaration. And what did we do? You know, you remember the sentence, every human being is born free and equal in dignity and rights. Dignity comes first, but we speak about human rights. Why? Because we focused on rights first. Why? Because they are more practically easily definable, more practical to apply. Dignity is so difficult, as, you, as I showed you. It's such a complex concept, so it's very difficult to define. Rights are easier. So therefore, we focused on rights first, and I think we have gone too far with that. We have gone too far with our focus on rights. We now need to focus on dignity. And here is another way to describe what happened in the past 5% of our history. What, why, why did we build these dominator societies? You see the, the triangles there at the bottom. You know, one dominator polity pitted in enmity towards the other. Sometimes it was an alliance, sometimes it was uh, enmity. In a divided, fractured world. The past 5%, the world was divided. Everybody was afraid of the other. The security dilemma is the name that political scientists give to that situation in the past 5% of our, of our history. Mm, you, you, you are here in Norway. You, you know perhaps that in Hitler suddenly sent a battleship up the Oslo fjord and that Norway was completely, completely surprised. How could somebody who they thought was an ally, suddenly become an enemy. This is the past 5% of our history. We were always afraid to be taken, to be conquered, to have enemies. And what was the motto, therefore, of the past 5% of our history? The motto was, if you want peace, prepare for war. Or, war for peace. Peace was attainable, people thought, only through security, military security. This is the past 5% of our history. And the security dilemma is a dilemma because nobody could escape it. Even the most peace-loving lord or king could not escape it. They would be toppled if they did not amass weapons. What does it mean, security dilemma? Security dilemma means I'm afraid of you, therefore I get some weapons. You see that, you get some weapons, you, we all get afraid, we get more and more weapons, we get an arms race, and almost, almost automatically we have war. So the past 5% of our history, we have system, systematic war in our, uh, among us on this planet. So what is the way out? What is your responsibility? Who, you, who are sitting here? Can you do something with this security dilemma? For thousands of years, nobody could escape it. Can you escape it? Can you? And if yes, how? What is the way to escape it? There's only one way, to my view. This is the way. This is to manifest in practice that we are one species, one family of human be beings on a very tiny, vulnerable planet. This must, we must man manifest. Then we can manifest what, what Gandhi said, namely, there is no path to peace. Peace is the path. It is, not, it is no, no longer peace through security, but security through peace. This is the future, and this is, to me, to my view, your responsibility. You are carrying that on your shoulders. And we have to speak to the men among us. You have been trained, males have been trained for the past millions, mi millennia, 10,000 years, to learn that to be a man, you must be a hero. You must be a victor. You must win over others. It's glorious. Competition for domination is male, it's glorious. Today, it's no longer glorious. Today, it is suicidal. So we have to ask all our men to find glory, not in 
winning over others. This is the task of the males and females here to explain, I think, to my view. And what is in the way, what stands in the way? I think dynamics of humiliation stand in the way and we have to become more aware of them. If you look at the left side there, you see the old dominator society, the old dominator model. And there, to humiliate somebody, to push somebody down in the hierarchy, you had many, many, many ways you could push somebody down. Conquest, humiliation, reinforcement, humiliation, relegation, humiliation. And only the last one, exiling somebody, killing somebody, was to exclude a person from humanity. All the other were less intense, less extreme. Only the last one, exiling somebody, was excluding this person from the community. What happens when we promise human rights ideals, when we go out in the world and say, we are all one family and everybody is equal in dignity? What do we do then? Then we define out all the first versions of humiliation, only the last one is, is there. Why? You know, when I promise you that you are equal, and we are equal, and we are one family, and then I debase you, I push you down, then you are out of human family immediately. So the most intense form of humiliation, when we talk about human rights, we create also the most intense form of humiliation in the world. This we have to be aware of. So what are the differences of, uh, in these two systems when we look at humiliation? If you look at the humiliation of honor, I talk of honor, in, of honor societies when I talk of dominator societies. When we look at the humiliation of honor, then the experience of humiliation lends legitimacy to become angry only to those in power. Only the aristocrat can go to duel to another aristocrat. Now, as soon as we speak about human rights ideals of equality and dignity, everybody is entitled to become angry when feeling humiliated. And these feelings are more intense than before. Like when Mandela went to his black brothers and sisters, he said, you are all entitled to get, get angry. You know, the Hutu in Rwanda felt we are all entitled to get angry when we feel humiliated. This is the new, it's more intense and millions of people get angry now. And this is a kind of side effect of human rights ideals. And then the subservient on, in the humiliation of honor in the dominator context subservient humility and shame are a virtue for the powerless the beaten wife and meeting out humiliation is a duty for the powerful like the husband's duty is to beat his disobedient wife now in the context of equal dignity of human rights ideals, subservient humility and shame are no longer a virtue. Only the ability to feel ashamed of arrogance remains a virtue. Like we would, we ask the white supremacists to feel ashamed of their supremacy, sense of supremacy. And the new ideal is dignified and proud humility. This is what we showed. It's dignified and proud humility. And this is the new ideal. So the, the world, the dominator world, the hierarchical world of honor is completely different to the, the uh, world of equal dignity. These are two different worlds. They cannot be brought together. I often uh, bring the example of honor killing. There you see how this is irreconcilable, these two systems. Uh, I was a clinical psychologist for many years in Egypt, seven years, and not only in Egypt have I sat in front of a woman who was crying and saying, our daughter has been raped, our family honor has been humiliated, we have tried to hide it, to marry her off to her rapist, nothing works, now she has to be killed to heal our 
humiliated family honor. I sit there. When you sit in front of a mother who says this, what do you think? What do you feel? You feel, I feel humiliated by simply listening to her. I feel the girl needs trauma treatment. She doesn't deserve to be killed. Killing is double humiliation. It's not healing. This is what I think. So here you have one moral universe where the girl must die and then another one where the girl must live. And if I had said to the mother, oh, you are a very bad mother, how can you ever think of killing your daughter? Aren't you a terrible mother? Then she would say, oh, you are an arrogant Western person who, look, you know, who, who, who humiliates my, my culture. So here you have two, I, once the girl must live, then the girl must die, and on top you have a meta dynamic of humiliation. I feel humiliated by her and she feels humiliated by me. So here you see the complexity of this transi transition towards equality and dignity. So if you look at somebody who has a sense of humiliation, who feels humiliated, what is the possible outcome? In the past, like the beaten wife, she was, would you know, accept it. She would simply accept it, like a natural disaster, like a medicine that tastes bitter but is good for you. She would accept to be beaten. Then you have, during history, you had a lot of people who were staging revolutions with violence. You have uh, Hitler, you have terrorism, the example of Rwanda. This is violent. And now you have the way out of humiliation, Mandela's way, and this is my way. The way of Mandela, it is peaceful social transformation in partnership, as you see the lying aid, in dialogue, in solidarity, in equal dignity, in unity, in diversity. What is another stumbling block? I think the most important stumbling block now might be the following. I call it security dilemma number two. And you see me there in front of Sukoti Park, the start of the Occupy movement in New York in 2011. And if you remember the motto of the classical um, secu security dilemma, which pits one state against another state, you remember it was, if you want peace, prepare for war. And I think that there we have now another fault line that pits the proverbial 1% against the proverbial 99%. We have a fault line between them. I hear that everywhere people say, if you want wealth, invest in exploitation. And I think again the solution, the responsible responsibility that you have is to manifest the human family that we are. We need globalization of care, of trust, of responsibility rather than globalization of exploitation. And again we have to learn, you know, in the beginning we thought it's glorious, glorious, you know, to uh, for example, smoking is good for you, glorious. All the inventions, the iPhone is glorious, everything is glorious what we start with. And we know smoking kills. Our overuse of the resources of our planet is not sustainable, it kills. So we have to learn that. Humanity, we are humanity. To me, we are this ship. Titanic. The people, the privileged people in the West, they live on the first floor and they paint their cabins pink, they play golf, they play um, games, they want to have a happy life, they want to have well-being there and they build very strong barriers against the lower part of the ship where the poor people live. Down in the ship, the poor people live, who basically have all the knowledge how to make this, the ship float. But the rich people in the four, first floor, they don't think, think of that. They forget that those down have all the knowledge, or a lot of knowledge. So the people at the top, they are occupied with having a good life and to make a barrier. And the people in the hull of the ship, they, have, they are very busy trying to come up. And what do all of them overlook? What do all of them overlook? 
What do all of them overlook? Not all of them. <laughs> yes, what do we overlook? We look, overlook the iceberg. And you know this uh, joke, uh, the uh, British lady who stood uh, uh, on Titanic with a glass of whiskey? You know, and she saw the iceberg and she said, Oh, I ordered some ice, but not so much. <laughs> And you see that? What, is, what do you read there? You know, the rich, they sit on the upper part of the boat and they say, Oh, we are sure glad that the hole isn't on our side. And I, I told you this in many of those who sit here. I, I shared with you this article, Survival of the Richest by Douglas uh, Rushkoff. Uh, who uh, described last year how he was invited by the richest hedge fund managers and how they already plan for uh, the fact that there will be this um, collapse that will sink the ship. They are already planning to, for that and how they think that they can survive, that somehow the first floor uh, on this luxury floor can, can be, uh, stay afloat for them only. Here is another joke. Yet, yes, the planet got destroyed, but for a beautiful moment in time, we created a lot of value for shareholders. So, where do we stand now? We as humankind can no longer think of ourselves as sailing on a luxury cruise ship. What we thought of as a cruise ship is a titanic facing icebergs. It has already hit the first icebergs by now, and we realize that we are on a lifeboat, not a, on a cruise ship. On a lifeboat, all hands are needed on deck. Everybody has to contribute with what they can. Nobody can buy themselves out of this joint effort. Whoever tries to gain a short-term personal advantage by exploiting others or using ecological resources contributes to the faster sinking of the lifeboat. This is our situation today, I think. If we look back again and we recapitulate our history as homo sapiens on this planet, we started about 200,000 years ago to a little bit more perhaps in a win-win situation. We had a party, we could always get more. We had a good party. Then about 12,000 years ago, it started to turn into a win-lose situation. And we adapted, we adapted by competing for domination. We became dominators. And this worked for the past 10,000 years. Then, 1757, we have this linguistic marker for the emergence of the notion of equality and dignity. Also, the emergence of what I said, dignity and humiliation, which is more intense than honor humiliation. Do you remember why it is more intense? So, we have a more intense humiliation in the world now, dignity humiliation. So, 1757 is a marker for that. Then, in the year 1967, 72, we see our planet from outside. And I think that we as humankind, we are oblivious of the fact that this is revolutionary, this image. I think all of you who have been born in one place, one city, one country, and then you come here, you come to another place, and then you look back at where you came from, and I think all of you have made this experience that you understand where you come from better when you are outside. Okay, so we as humankind, we understand who we are better since we can look at us from outside. The astronaut's perspective is extremely revolutionary, therefore. It's a paradigm shift. Now we can understand that we are one species and that there are no borders. When you look at, at planet Earth, there are no borders. This the astronaut said. This was the first comment they said, oh, we don't see borders. So this image is, is absolutely revolutionary. 
In 1980, we started to overuse our resources. Now we use 1.5 to 2 planets. We don't have so many planets, but you, we use already one planet, more than one planet. If we continue, like we do now, if we continue the same strategy, the same path as now, soon we will need five to six planets just to continue. And we all know it's impossible. It's an absurd thought. This is an, a utopia that is dangerous, that we are living now. We are living in a dangerous utopia. To my view. So, in 1991, there was the end of the Cold War and there was a window of opportunity to manifest that we are one family on one planet who has to take care of this, that planet and be a steward of this planet. We had this possibility and we did not use it. In 2007 and 2008, we had this econ economic crisis and now, basically, we, um, we no longer have this blind belief in the wisdom of the market. We lost it. And now, what is your responsibility? What is my responsibility? It is to create a new win-win situation without systemic humiliation. So, is there a way forward from the win-lose mentality of systemic humiliation to a new win-win for all? This is the question to you. And I like a lot anthropologist Alan Page Fiske. He did a lot of research and he found that basically people collaborate, cooperate in four ways. There is communal sharing, which is what a family does, a good family. You give what you can, you get what you need. Then there is authority ranking, which can be a good thing or a bad thing, like it could be a good parents, but it could also be a bad like, dictator. Then you have equality matching, which means exchange. I give you my... Um, you, you take care of my cat if I uh, water your plants. Exchange. And then you have market pricing. And uh, it follows the scale, the well-known scale of measurement in mathematics from uh, nominal to ordinal to interval to ratio. And ratio is the most quantitative and uh, nominal is the most qualitative and comprehensive. And what we do today is to give priority to the most narrow form of collaboration, which is ratio, which is market pricing. In that way, we, we turn this, you know, communal sharing should be at the top, should define our ways of being together. This is the most comprehensive qualitative. This is where we do not ask our grandmother to make a living or the baby to make a living. We turn this and we sell our grandmother, we sell our soul. We put market pricing at the top of everything we do. And uh, the moment we put market pricing at the top of everything we do, basically it, it is a su suicidal uh, strategy, to my view. I have written a book, A Dignity Economy, where I explain that. So this is the next book that will come out this year. So if we look again at our history as human species on this planet, you see on the left side the first 95%. We could spread out happily, Heck, it was a kind of horizontal expansion, we could live, manifest unity in diversity. We had a party, it was good. Then, about 12,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago, it's, it stopped. Circumscription kicked in. In that case, it was the fact that circumscription basically means that something we thought was infinite is finite. So, suddenly, it made, the fact made itself uh, palpable that the surface of planet Earth is limited in size. And we adapted, we adapted by learning domination, by learning to compete for domination, for dominance. Vertical expansion, we created dominator societies. We lived in a world of uniformity within in-groups, in division to out-groups. Today, where are we today? Circumscription kicks in again. It hits us in the face. The fact that something is finite that we thought was unlimited. 
We now know that clean water is limited, finite. Clean air is finite. Minerals are finite. We cannot continue with building, having all these iPhones every year, new iPhones. They eat up the resources of our planet. You know, the digital revolution, we use a lot of energy. So we, we learn about finiteness, finiteness, finiteness now. Okay, so what do we do now? What should we do and what do we do? What we do now is to maximize the adaptation we learned 10,000 years ago. We learned how to compete for domination and we maximize it now. This is when you, you listen to the news in the, uh, you, you hear we need growth, economic growth. If you hear the word economic growth, then in reality it's an exponential curve. And in a finite context, an exponential curve is absurd. You cannot ask a person who is 16 years old to continue growing infinitely. It's an absurd concept. It can't work. What we have to learn is to go in circles, to go in solidarity, to go in partnership, rather than dominating each other and dominating, dominating nature. We have to learn to go in circles, in partnership. Basically, what we have to do is to go back 10,000 years, 12,000 years, and, and ask ourselves, what did we do then? We adapted to a win-lose situation by learning how to out-compete each other. This is what we learned, and to, to exploit the resources of our planet. Okay, now we see this is a suicidal strategy. We cannot continue. We have to rethink what we did 10,000 years ago. We have to find a new adaptation to a win-lose situation, and soon we will have a lose-lose situation. How do we turn a lose-lose situation into a win-win situation? This is what we have to learn now. And interestingly, we have all the resources. You have all the knowledge. Humankind has never had all the knowledge to do it. We have all the knowledge. We can manifest that we are one family that has to take care of our planet together as our commons. The planet is our commons. We can. We have everything, you have everything. Please do it. So, here we have the um, sustainable development goals and you see there this uh, curve, the exponential curve in the middle there, number eight. And to my view, and I have discussed that with a lot of people at the UN, uh, I remember in November two th years ago I stood in front of this in the UN building in New York and we were discussing it and we were agreeing that this curve there, this exponential curve, undermines all the rest of the goals. You know uh, Greta Thunberg? Yes. And you know that there was another girl? You know, yeah. She talked in 1992 in Rio to all the heads of states and he said, she said exactly the same as Greta Thunberg now. Exactly the same. It was exactly the same speech that this girl held then. All the heads of states, and they were very impressed, very impressed. 20 years later, at Rio plus 20 in Rio, and I was at that time in Brazil, she came back 20 years later. You see her 20 years older on the, on the right side. She came back, and what did she say? Nothing has happened. So, what do I see as a as way into the future? What do I see as a dignified future for us uh, on this planet? I was thinking a lot, do we need an ism? When I go around and uh, I talk about co communism in America or socialism in certain uh, contexts in the United States, I will be dead on the spot if I, if I utter that word. People get extremely angry at that, simply at mentioning that word. And if I go, I remember in Chile I was speaking, and if I use the word, I was uh, use the word capitalism, I was dead. So uh, these words, capitalism and socialism and communis communism, basically now I see they are markers of circles of of humiliation. People feel humiliated by these notions. And often they don't know what, what it means, communism or capitalism. What does it mean? Nobody knows, but it's, 
it's a marker for, for anger, for feelings of humiliation. So I thought, I don't want to use these words anymore. Thank you very much. You know, I don't want to contribute to these cycles of humiliation. So what do we humans need an ism? Perhaps not, but if we need an ism, why not go from dignity? Why not say dignism, which would be unity in diversity, partnership, dialogue, non-dualism? So what would it be? And I try to define it. It would, be, it would mean a world where every newborn finds space and is nurtured to unfold their highest and best, embedded in a social context of loving appreciation and connection. A world where the caring capacity of the planet guides the ways in which everybody's basic needs are met. A world where we are united in building trust and respecting human dignity and celebrating diversity, where we prevent unity from being perverted into oppressive uniformity and keep diversity from sliding into hostile division. <laughs> I came to Norway in 1977. This is me, Rauland Hotel in 1980-something. And I want to tell you that Norway is an, a special place, a unique place. And I describe myself as an ambassador of the Norwegian cultural heritage, which is in resonance with dignism. Interestingly, and therefore Norway is the most important platform for my global work. Already Henrik Vergeland is a very famous Norwegian author. He makes, made the point that Norway's disadvantaged geopolitical setting may now be an advantage. Why? You see here Central Europe. This is Central Europe. You see walls everywhere. Why do you not see walls in Norway? Why? <laughs> yes, too, too far away, too, power, too poor, before the oil was found. It's, uh, nobody really bothered to, to uh, conquer Norway. Nobody wanted to really conquer it. The Danish were here, some few people were in Oslo, in Christiania, but they never really conquered the country. So the, the Viking uh, lords or, or um, Hövdings, uh, clan leaders or family leaders, they remained, you know, the pride of the Vikings is still there. Every farmer has his own little uh, kingdom or is his own king, his own philosopher. Which, with all the, the, the dark sides, because you have no country in the world where more neighbor conflicts are than in Norway. So, um, I, I am a, a global ambassador of the Norwegian cultural heritage of, and what is it? Likeverd, which is equality in dignity. Dugnad, which is solidarity, and global responsibility, if you remember Nansen, Nansen's passport. So now, uh, how much time do we still have? Five minutes. Good. So now, until now, I was carrying one hat. Until now, I ask you to not believe a single word I said, said until now. Please do not believe me. Only use what I said as an inspiration for you to think. Okay? Just take me as an inspiration. Find your own way of thinking. So now this is my, was my head of a researcher, of me as a person who lives globally. But now I take off this head, I put another head on me now, okay? Now I will explain to you that I'm also the unifier of a global dignity family. So in the spirit of unity in diversity, I'm the unifier of a global network of people where I'm also part of the, their diversity. So now I'm taking the head of being the unifier of a global dignity movement. And why? Why do I do this? It is, the aim is to see how can we turn our blue planet into a blue planet again? At the moment, as I told you, 
We are drowning our planet and burning it. How can we make a, a blue planet again? What I do is to convene a global dignity family. It's called Human Dignity and Humiliation Studies. It's a global fellowship of like-minded academics and practitioners, a not-for-profit labor of love, for working for a new future for humankind rather than against old structures. We have now 1,000 members upon invitation. It's upon invitation. And if you want to be part, you are warmly welcome. You need to write to me and I invite you. And about 7,000 people on the, on the address list. And uh, you see here the core group of people. You see a lot of people from Norway here. Precisely because Norway is the place where the notion of equality and dignity and dugnad, solidarity, is a cultural heritage. Therefore, here it is, I, I, I notice it. When I come to Norway, I don't have to explain it. Everybody knows it. When I come already to Sweden, people don't have it under their skin. They have unequality under their skin. <laughs> Sorry to all the Swedes who are not, I overgeneralize, so I'm, I'm accepting all the Swedes who are here. You are exempted from that prejudice. Our work has been, our work has been nominated for the Peace, Nobel Peace Prize three times in 2015, 16, 17, because it is in the spirit of the founder uh, of, of the Nobel Peace Prize, uh, Bertha von Suttner. We have two conferences per year, one in December in New York, workshop on transforming humiliation and violent conflict. It is the 5th and 6th of December at Columbia University. Please come in December to New York. You are invited. <laughs> then we have another, a second conference, a second dig dignity conference every year in every year in a different place. Next one is in September in the Amazon in Brazil, in Marabá, Pará, the, the gate to the industrialization of the Amazon, which is a terrible place where we are needed to, it's needed that we show our faces. This is now uh, one of our uh, New York conferences that you see there. This is this, the last conference we had now, it's last September in Egypt. This is the next conference in, uh, in Marabah. Please come. Come to the Amazon. Please. And uh, we have also founded a, a publishing house, Dignity Press. We need somebody now who takes over the leadership. So if you have an uncle or a father who is just retired, who has all the expertise, we need a person who wants to give a certain number of years to develop Dignity Press further. And we have World Dignity University Initiative, which is an initiative that also needs a leader now. And I have here, you know, Arne is already pointing at it. I have here a table where my global footprint is uh, visible. And everybody who is interested can come and ask me about all the things and you can choose a gift here from my global life. <coughs> is there hope? Yes. No. Where is the hope? Where is the hope? Where? Evelyn, yes. thank you very much for everything that you do, <laughs> for coming here. You, as we said, you'll stay on. For those who'd like to see more about what she's brought from many places, she likes to give something to everywhere she comes. Hope the chocolate goes around. <laughs> we just like to bring you 
that you should bring on a little bit from us here as well. So this Wonderful. is uh, for you. We have a big book. It's quite patriarchal, and I didn't want to give that to you. <laughs> so this is, uh, I Wonderful. think, much better. Thank uh, you. For our students, first years and second years, have a dignified match. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> enjoy it. And I, want a picture, I want a picture of all, if I'm uh, allowed. And before you go, a picture from Evelyn. With, of, yes. How do you want it 